Trudy Vadera, good, uh, good to speak to you. Thank you very much for coming to talk to us. Uh, there's a lot of concern as we recover from the pandemic that we are in danger of exacerbating pre-existing inequalities. Give us your thoughts on inequalities that might have been increased by the global pandemic. Uh, COVID has cracked wide open and deepened the fissures and the inequities that already existed before the pandemic. Uh, 250 million jobs lost uh, last year, global labour income declined by 8%, 120 million people fell back into poverty, and it disproportionately impacted the poor, black and ethnic minority communities, women, uh, young and unskilled workers. Uh, advanced economies provided direct and indirect fiscal support equivalent to 28% of their GDP. Emerging and developing economies only spent seven and 2% uh, respectively. Loss in GDP per capita known as scarring um, over a four year period in emerging markets is expected to be over twice that uh, in advanced economies. Of course, many of these inequities and trends within countries existed pre-pandemic. It was fueled by technology transformation, which labor markets had not yet adjusted to. Uh, this had sort of disrupted a 70 years of great moderation in which there was a stable division of income between labor and capital. Uh, but we then we had increasing concentration and growth and capital accumulation in certain sectors, mm. companies, individuals, and where ordinary people turning up to work to exchange their labor, their skills, their time for wages was no longer allowing them to participate fairly in wealth creation and the great advances of society. And COVID, COVID has put these trends on steroid. Uh, for decades, we believed in globalization's gains, uh, but ignored its pains, which were very local, uh, direct, very acute. And we thought we could go back to how things were after the great financial crisis, even though in many countries it led to a decade of wage stagnation. And then we were surprised by the backlash which hmm. followed, uh, including the rise of nationalism and populism. And as a result, political and geopolitical risk is now high on the risk registers yes. of most companies in a way that it never was a decade ago. And of so course we've seen... Yeah, and of course, we've seen very different pandemic responses from different countries. And I wonder if that is in danger of leading, uh, leading to very divergent outcomes. Yes, of course, uh, I, I generalize hugely, but to make the point, we could say that many emerging markets, especially in Asia, uh, proved better at containment uh, last year than advanced economies. But now the advanced economies are overall vaccinating more quickly. They're starting to remove restrictions, seeing uh, surging demand growth recovery, faster than emerging markets possibly ex except uh, China, of course. But there is this differential pace of economic rebound is very uh, difficult in an interconnected world. It slows down uh, recovery, especially for open economies uh, who have supply chain and demand dependencies. And to the extent that the rebound leads to the exit of support measures in advanced economies and possibly interest rate increases, especially in US dollars, before emerging markets are ready to come out of the containment to start their rebound, it will exacerbate their economic uh, woes. So sequencing is the key. Uh, the multiplier effect of everyone recovering simultaneously is huge, and the unevenness of the recovery will um, hold us all back. And of course, in addition to the issue of differential recovery, I would like to mm. say that we seem to be living in a world where the, in the public discourse, it's as if the recovery will be costless. Uh, but debt with the economic vaccine, uh, uh, you know, debt was like an economic vaccine. Um, uh, global uh, sovereign debt is 120% of GDP, just short of the levels of the Second World War, in fact. And that's a big bet on sustaining high levels of real growth over the next decade. OK, and so we would need to see a coordinated response, it sounds like, to, to tackle this. Are we seeing enough coordination in the response? Well, you know, the clue is in the name. It's a pandemic, not an endemic. And the idea that it can be dealt with only with national strategies for vaccination and containment is sort of farcical. Um, as we found in the financial crisis, if by virtue of its ability to spread contagion, uh, financial, uh, economic or health, uh, if, 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 it's, if, if by its ability to spread contagion, a phenomenon is global, 
then coordinated and cooperative responses will obviously be the most effective way in saving lives and livelihoods. And a health contagion recognizes borders even less than finance. Uh, the G7 pledge last week is welcome, but it's not adequate for the scale and the urgency of the real threat that variants will continue to be created, um, including those that might evade vaccines, and, uh, and can infect each of us until most of us across the world yes. has been vaccinated. This isn't altruism, it's just self-protection. Um, the G7 have purchased over a third of the world's vaccine supply, but make up only 13% of the population. There's a very straightforward plan written by the IMF and the World Bank, supported by the WHO and the okay. WHO. These are our institutions of international cooperation. This plan has a cost benefit of one to 180. That is arguably the best okay. investment you can ever make. Shriti, thank you very much. Thanks for your time. Shriti Vadera from Prudential.